they say she's a miracle. And he's like, yeah, I'd say so. He's like, I've never seen a brain like this that's alive. I've never, I've never seen somebody like her. And that's every doctor that sees me. Well, I want to thank you again for being here. Seriously, taking the time. So it's a... Uh, my my friend Caitlin, who I think you might have spoke to Caitlin, and I'll probably take. Yeah, I did her podcast. Yeah, right, yeah, and she was the one that recommended that you uh, brought you to my attention the first time. And you know, I, yeah. I've had a few near death experience episodes and just um, episodes in general about you know nearly dying and crossing over and all that stuff. So it's it's fascinating to me. And as I've said in uh, in prior episodes, you know, and I've heard you kind of speak about it. How if it's some, it's it's very hit or miss in regards to what people believe, and that's yeah. And I, I like the approach of you know it's whatever people believe, and that's why I like putting these conversations out there and kind of let people, you know, decide on their own. We're all we're all big boys and girls. I think it's I think that's okay. So I, I would yeah. love I would love for you to start. I know you told the story before. Wherever you want in regards to your experience with, would you say your experience you crossed over? How, how did you, how did you explain it exactly? It was December twenty. 20- second uh a year, so 13 months ago um I went to bed I had a really bad headache I went to bed my husband brought me like Tylenol and Advil because my head was hurting so bad I learned later that was my carotid dissecting which is what caused the stroke um and I had the stroke within like an hour and a half of going to bed and I didn't wake up till the next morning and I, when I woke up the next morning I was paralyzed I was nonverbal. Um, apparently I was making kind of weird noises and I could say my sister's name and fuck those two things are the only things I could say. I didn't realize I was realize I wasn't talking because your brain doesn't really compute when you've had a stroke, at least my type. And so I I fell out of bed because I didn't know I was paralyzed. Um, and my husband wasn't in bed. He had fallen asleep on the couch and I was trying to get to the door but I, it, there was not even a shadow of movement. So I was completely paralyzed and it's dead weight. You can't, I was trying to army crawl with one arm to get to the door and I couldn't. Um, so I banged on the wall and my husband thought it was gunshots. Like we live in a neighborhood. There's no guns here. Well, and I live in Canada too. Like we're not a very like gun friendly country. And so he was like, what was that? Um, and got up and came in and he opened the door. He didn't turn on the light. And He's like, what are you doing? Why are you on the bed, uh, on the ground? And I tried to talk, but I guess I was, it's almost like grunting. Like it, my, the part of my brain that could talk in four words is completely gone. And so he came over and tried to pick me up because he thought maybe I was dreaming or sleep paralysis. And if you've ever picked up somebody that's paralyzed, you're very heavy. And he was like, what the hell? And so he put me down because he couldn't pick me up. And I only weighed like 130 pounds. I'm not huge. Um, And he turned on the light. And he is trained in first aid. He's like level three first aid. So the highest level you can go um, for work. And he walked around me because I was kind of, my back was to the door. And he looked at me. (laughs) Probably not the right thing to say. He said, I think you're having a fucking stroke. Because I was completely droopy. he, he did the things that be fast, you raise your arms, stick your tongue out, try to talk those things. I couldn't do any of it. Um, and the banging also work, woke my mom because her bedroom is below ours. They live in our basement suite and she came up. And of course, I sleep naked. <laughs> this is a little of aside. Course. <laughs> and I'm like, so my mom is in the room now. I don't understand what's going on. I know he's on the phone with the ambulance and he said the word stroke. And I'm, I still sort of thought I was dreaming or something, but all I wanted was clothes. I knew he was on the phone and people were coming and I'm just like, get me. Cl-. And I kept hitting myself, but they thought I was like, cause I couldn't move. I couldn't get off the floor and I was paralyzed. And I'm just like trying to say, can you get me some clothes? And, uh, So I got really upset. I like, I think started crying because I like I'm naked and there's going to be all these people. Um, So finally they did get uh, clothes and the ambulance people came. And unfortunately, we live in a nice house in a nice neighborhood. They thought I was drunk. And so they thought like I was like a drunk housewife. And they're like, we don't think it's a stroke, blah, 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 Um, which 
it was clear it was. My whole right side of my face was, was completely droopy. I couldn't talk. I couldn't move. If you dropped my arm, it just fell because I was paralyzed. And so anyways, they didn't work really fast, unfortunately. It didn't really matter in the end because the, the stroke was complete. Like you have a time frame to get that medication. So they get me to the hospital, didn't put on their sirens because they thought I was drunk or high. And I don't drink and I don't do drugs. Uh, you know, like I, I don't, all the stroke risks, I don't smoke, I don't take birth control, nothing like that. But um, so we get to the hospital and they come into triage and they're all talking and laughing with all the other ambulance guys and not paying attention to me. And I was getting really, really scared because I couldn't say anything. And I actually grabbed onto the hand of the one paramedic and he looked at me and he was like, oh my gosh. He said it in the ambulance too. He thought maybe I was having a stroke and he looked at me and he looked scared. And then a nurse, male nurse turned around and looked at me and he actually said, what the fuck are you guys doing? She's obviously having a stroke. And then he called the stroke code over the phone. So it wasn't great treatment. My husband is very frustrated because of that. And then I kind of was in and out of consciousness. Um, I do remember a few things, but the stroke was so, so bad. My brain was swelling so rapidly. So I had the MCA2 stroke, which was complete. So the this entire side of my brain is completely gone. It doesn't regrow or anything. It's just fluid. And that caused a secondary stroke in my frontal lobe. And so very quickly then I had a CT, um, Mike was on the way to the hospital. And then a lot of stuff I don't remember. I was still conscious. I was still in my body. I wasn't on the other side yet, but I, like, I kind of remember a few things. They did offer TPA, which is a clotting med medication they give to stroke people. Um, and it can reverse the stroke. At that point, they didn't know it was a completed stroke because I'd only had a CT, not an MRI. Um, and so my, my husband had to give consent. They gave me the TPA and it didn't work. Like it's usually instantaneous and it didn't work. Um, no movement, no nothing. Um, and they bring a crash card in and everything because like 50% of people that are given that medication die. There's nothing they can do. The medication's so strong that you just die, you bleed out. And so they give you Benadryl too. And I found out I am anaphylactic to Benadryl. So I started having an allergic reaction all the way up my neck and swelling. And so they treated that. Um, and then they realized the hospital here is not equipped. Like they can't do the brain surgery to like treat the stroke. Um, so I needed to be airlifted. And there's a whole bunch more to the story, you know, different doctor things and whatever, but they decided I had to be airlifted. So all my family quickly came to the hospital because they said um, I was going to die. They said, like, there's almost no chance she's going to survive, um, but we're going to do this anyways to just give her the best chance. So they even insisted my kids who are, you know, young teenagers come to say goodbye. My husband didn't want them to. He didn't want to scare them. And so they, yeah, they came, all the family came. This I remember a little, I, you know, I was in and out, but I, I was um, completely blind in my right eye at first. Magically after the NDE, I woke up and I wasn't blind anymore. But like my first MRI, my eye was all the way in the back of my head, which is you're blind. Uh, this one was fine, but this one wow. was not. No, Sorry? I'm just responding, reacting, yeah. how, how intense that is. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So everybody kept coming because the, the door to the room was on this side. So they kept coming to this side and I was completely blind. So I didn't know they were there, but the family got to come in. And I remember a little bit of the goodbyes, but at that point I was so like brain damaged. I, I was barely, barely, um, clinging to life sort of. And so they got me prepped. The, the life flight came. Um, they got me out to the life flight and they allowed my husband to come in the helicopter. They usually don't, but they were almost positive. I wouldn't make it to the other hospital and it's only a 15 minute flight, but they didn't want me to die without any family. Right. So he got to come in the the helicopter. My family all stood and watched it take off before then they had to go pack and it's a two hour drive to the other hospital. Um, 
And that's when everything started shifting. So it went from, I was aware of what was going on. I was very scared. Like that first hour or whatever, I was so scared. Everything just, it's very scary to be paralyzed and, and your brain not well enough to tell you that. Like it, I just, I couldn't understand. I kept like hitting myself. I kept grabbing onto myself because it was like it was somebody else's body and I couldn't figure out why I felt nothing. I, I The medications they gave me were really hard on me. It was just horrible. And it went from like the most scary time of my life. And I got in that, that helicopter. We sat down and it was, I don't know, six in the morning by then. And so the sun had started coming up and we went into the air and I started getting really hot. When you are, when you have a brain injury and, or when you're starting to die, your temperature rises. So I started getting a fever. Um, and I didn't necessarily feel super hot, but I, my husband could see like I was really, really red. So he put his hand up to block the sun from my eyes. But I guess I didn't really want it there. And I, I just want as soon as the sun hit my face, that was it. I was gone. I was on the other side. My soul left my body. I wasn't dead. Um, I was just barely alive, like just barely. And I could see my body. Like as soon as I was out of my body, I could see it. I could see my husband and I could see me in all oh, balls. Energetic interference. Shit. <laughs> Me, uh... it, on my end, on my end, it still says it's recording and it didn't stop. Okay. Yeah. Let me just, um, I'm going to just, when I hold that thought, it should still be there. This app usually, if it, I'm assuming it is, but let me just triple check <laughs> because this is insane. Okay. Um, Welcome to my whole life. <laughs> but it, it says on your end that it's still recording. Yeah. It's, right. We're at 20 minutes, 58 seconds. All right, sweet. Then that should, then that should be fine. It's just, uh, whoever's doing and it. And it didn't stop. Like, Okay. Yeah, you just disappeared, but it continued to record. All right, if it's my dad, then he's got to chill out, dude. All right, come on. Um, <laughs> all right, so please continue on. We just had another uh, energetic interference. We'll explain what that is later. Thank you, guys. <laughs> okay. So it was a good good timing. As soon as I go to the other side, it Yeah, so, as soon as it happened, I was like, she just crossed over, and all of a sudden this – this crosses out. Okay. Peace out. I okay. So, I was so into it. Okay. I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. So he, I left my body. I could see my body, but it was like, I was like, I, kind of like you've seen movies, right? When they're like, oh, I floated above my body. I wasn't floating. I just wasn't there anymore. Like I, I closed my eyes. The sun was on my face. I closed my eyes. That sun somehow went from the sun to just the brightness and the calm of the other side. And then I opened my eyes and I was on the other side and I was like, okay, that's weird. I like, I didn't a hundred percent feel like, okay, this is it. Like I'm dead. I, and I, and so I, I don't know. It was very strange. It went from in my body to on the other side. And the second you're on the other side, everything makes sense. Mm. any question you've ever had about yourself. And again, this is my experience. A lot of people don't have this same experience. I am, you know, I accepted my gifts long before I died. I, I have a much different energy, as you can tell by all the electronics freaking failing all around me. Right. So it is a different experience than a lot of people who have NDEs. A lot of people go there and, it's beautiful and wonderful. It's maybe a garden or something like that. And then somebody comes, whether it's a family member or God, and says, you need to go back. You're not finished. You have to go back. I didn't have that. Thank you to BetterHelp for sponsoring this week's episode. I've never done therapy prior to trying out BetterHelp myself. and only took me 33 years to try it, but they made the experience a lot easier to navigate. I'm not going to lie. I always felt a little bit nervous to go to therapy and to do it at the comfort of my own home in sweatpants with the ability to access a vast network of therapists to find the right one for me made it a lot easier. BetterHelp is the world's largest therapy service, and it's 100% online. With BetterHelp, you can tap into a network of over 25,000 and experienced therapists who can help you with a wide range of issues. To get started, 
You just need to answer a few questions about your needs and your preferences in therapy. That way, BetterHelp can match you with the right therapist from their network. Then you can talk to your therapist literally however you feel comfortable, whether it's on the text, chat, phone, or video call. You can message your therapist at any time and schedule live sessions when it's convenient for you. If your therapist isn't the right fit for any reason, you can switch to a new therapist at no additional charge. With BetterHelp, you get the same professionalism and quality you expect from in-office therapy, but with a therapist who's custom-picked for you. More scheduling flexibility and a way more affordable price. We'll give you 10% off your first month at BetterHelp.com slash DeadTalks. That's BetterHelp.com slash DeadTalks. Now back to the show. I went there. I was in this beautiful... It was a field surrounded by gardens. Uh, There was a gazebo and a bench beside it. And there was like a creek running sort of under the grass from like a pond to this little creek. And my guides were there and I already knew them. Again, I accepted my gifts in 2015. So I knew them. I knew what they looked like. I knew their names and everything. And they were just there in support. They didn't tell me what to do. They didn't help me make the choice. So my NDE was specifically to make a choice whether I was going to die and stay there or not. Um, I've always, always had faith when I die, I will wake up on the other side and there'll be a huge Christmas party because I am Christmas crazy and all my family will be there and I will have a unicorn. So I'm like, this is, that's me dying. And so I'm like, okay, I'm not dead. So this is true. Like I'm, I get to make this choice. And so Time doesn't exist on the other side. So in actual fact, like I probably went to the other side five minutes into the helicopter ride. And then it was about another 10 minutes of in the helicopter. And then we landed in within a very short amount of time. My brain was swelling so quickly that I my body couldn't handle it. And so I had a massive grand mal seizure. And that is when I would have died. And so, you know, it was, a, it was maybe 25 minutes that my soul was out of my body. And again, different than most NDEs. A lot of people die, you know, for a minute or two, completely die. And her, their soul goes to the other side in order for their body to survive. If your soul is in your body, you're going to die a lot quicker. And so it wasn't that long, but it felt like I was there for 50 years, 100 years, 10 minutes, like there, there just was no time, no pressure. There was nobody saying you need to make this choice because, you know, if you're going to die, the seizure is going to kill you. So you have this much time till you have the seizure. There was nothing like that. And I, I, you know, the choice was important. That's great. But there was also these amazing benefits of being over there. I looked amazing. Like, my 25 year old self, but on crack, like I, my body was perfect. I was wearing a beautiful white eyelet dress off the shoulder, which I don't wear. I have had kids and it's not a thing, right? You just don't. Uh, And no wrinkles, no, I never, you know, no gray hair, no scars, no pain, um, no fear, no, like just nothing. Um, And my guide's did gently guide me and they showed me, you know, if you stay here, your family's going to be okay. Um, my, my kids and my husband were over there as well. I could see them. They were standing there because if it, if the choice was to leave my kids and not see them until they die, I would have just come right back. It wouldn't have been a choice. I would have been like, you know, I love my husband, but my kids are like, they're my kids. Right. Um, So they were standing on the other side because our higher selves are always there. So I, I think it kind of sounds assholey. Sorry if I'm not supposed to swear, but the swearing didn't disappear. That is on this side of the brain. So I could (laughs) swear the whole time. Um, I like that. So yeah, it's great. (laughs) So my, like the thought, so many people have asked me, like, weren't you like really sad being able to see your family and see your kids and how, how much trauma they were going through? I wasn't. Time and space don't exist. So this life is a blink of an eye. You know, as soon as you're over there, this life doesn't necessarily exist for you because each one of us is living 
infinite lives in infinite time dimensions and we can go back and forth in any of them you know we can decide like for you as an example uh you've had some trauma in your life if you go to the other side when you die in this life and you go you know what i think i either didn't learn enough or i didn't want to learn all of that i'm going to do that one again and i'm going to take that out and i am going to live this life again without that happening and see what it would look like and see what it would feel like so all of that doesn't weigh into your decisions over there because in a way it doesn't exist it does but it doesn't like i could see and you know during the time i was there i would check in kind of check in um and i could see my family oh my gosh the bargaining right at that stage it's not anger it's not sadness it's bargaining if you let her live i will do this this and this if you bring her back to us or help her survive i will i'll never have a drink again i'll never be mean to her again i'll never swear at my mom or disagree i will never be frustrated with my sister my daughter whatever i am to them um and i could see that and i knew it was hard but my soul didn't feel like I was responsible for that because they chose this life too. They chose that their mom, sister, daughter would go through this and they knew that that was part of the plan. And so it just didn't factor into the decision. What factored in was my guides showing me essentially my future. You know, I've learned a lot in my past. Um I have not had a super easy life. It's not fun being born like me. Uh maybe it is now, but it wasn't when I was young. I was an odd kid, you know, I could see dead people from the moment I was born, and I thought everybody else could see them at first, and when I realized they couldn't, it's not fun. It, it wasn't enjoyable to be a child. It wasn't enjoyable to be a teenager, and I struggled until I accepted my gifts. I I sort of found myself and made it work but you know like it it wasn't fun and it wasn't super easy and they showed me the amazing things I was going to do if I came back there they did tell me I would have some physical complications and they told me the first 18 months after that stroke was going to be the hardest you've ever lived and again i haven't lived an easy life so i'm like what the fuck like what does that mean but when you're over there nothing feels overwhelming so like mm. when i made when they showed me that like 18 months it's going to be so hard like you are going to wake up paralyzed i i couldn't talk i couldn't walk i couldn't eat i couldn't go to the bathroom i couldn't i couldn't do anything i literally had to relearn absolutely every skill and it was very hard and also because of the seizure they put me on like freaking a horse sized dose of anti seizure medication because if i had another seizure while my brain was healing it will kill me like that full stop it would just kill me and so you know i knew all that they showed me that i didn't really like when i woke up from the nde it it took me a long time to gain consciousness it was a couple of days before i sort of started realizing what was happening and it was like it was i was almost on a high for 3 or 4 days and then i wasn't and i was like what the fuck like why like this is my life like my family's going to have to take care of me like maybe it was a dream because there's no way i'm going to go from this to what they showed me like that's just how is that even possible like you know like i i can't even get up i can't eat i can't swallow i can't talk and you're telling me you know in 18 months 2 years whatever i'm going to be this person who's speaking to the most important people trying to help humans to be less assholey you know like to be caring and and understand that no matter who we are or where we are there is only one type of human you know on the other side there's no gender there's no race there's no ethnicity there's there's nothing like that we're just souls and we're slowly working towards that belief with a lot of fight and angriness and all of that type of stuff but if 
they had told me or shown me that as a human, I would have probably stayed on the other side. And that feeling stuck with me for a while. That first few months was so hard. And, you know, I had this shining sort of brightness of being on the other side, but it does, it, it, it doesn't always feel real because human bodies are heavy. And, you know, I still, you know, I'm 13 months out. I can't feel my right side at all. Full stop. I have no sensory. I, I have chronic pain and I don't take painkillers because it inter interferes with my gifts. Um, so I'll be living with chronic pain probably for the rest of my life. Um, I think I'm different in the fact that my mind, my soul, I can kind of not conquer it, but I don't know, mind over matter kind of thing. Right. But they were so clear that, you know, it was going to be so hard. And I'm coming up to that 18 months and already things are getting so much better. And so many, you know, I'm writing a book. It might even be available by the summer. And for me, that's awesome that I'm writing a book. But for them, it's that much many more people that can hear their words of encouragement and help people to start to understand there is no wrong path. You know, our society has gone from religious, do this or you are going to hell, to spiritual. If you don't focus on your spiritual path, you're not going to feel like you're living your purpose. The only purpose we have is to learn. And I think we're mixing that up. You know, we can pay so many people now to tell us what our purpose is. The only purpose we have is to learn. That's it. That's why we come here. The other side is our home. This is our school. And I think people don't fully realize that. But I, again, you know, my story and my situation is very different than most. Well, than all. My guides told me I'm the only one that has had this happen, right? Mm -hmm. That I was very gifted before. Mm -hmm. And now I'm more gifted, but also have an NDA so that my, or NDE, so my beliefs that I had faith in before now to me are so concrete, if that makes sense. What is, what's the explanation for how you've had that experience? Others don't, some people may get close to the edge and they don't have an NDE. How does that work? So for sort of, I see souls at ages, you know, young souls, old souls, anybody like middle age or younger will see nothing because if they see anything, they won't come back. Again, that's our home. The second you catch a glimpse, it is like, how do I explain? When we're born, we choose to have human amnesia. So we don't remember the other side past the age of like three to five. Babies can see it um, because, you know, being a baby is scary. You can't talk and stuff like that. Um, but we lose that, you know, unless you're like me. Around the age two to five, we don't remember it anymore. When you see it again, it is almost like a craving. Like think of the most intense craving you've ever had. And you just want to go there. When you say see it, you're saying back home? Yeah. Okay. So like if, if a younger soul, I don't know, overdoses or has a heart attack, um, you know, so many people are like, oh, I had a heart attack. My heart stopped for three minutes or something and I saw nothing. It's because that's what you chose. You chose to see nothing or you wouldn't have lived and you have a purpose here still. Anybody that's had an NDE will be at least middle age or older. But even then, some people just don't have the capability to see it and come back. Because they have they, more to learn? Is that, is that, is it more to learn, but also everything makes sense. And you just go, oh, my God, that's where we belong. That's how easy it is. Like, that's what it feels like to not have human struggles. Screw this. Yeah. I ain't coming back, like, peace out. And then a lot of other people um, go, like, have an NDE and are just automatically told to come back. And again, almost always, that is your, your sort of human self and your higher self saying, okay, my body is in a lot of pain right now. This is horrible. I don't want to feel it. So they get to go to the other side. 
almost like just being held there, cared for. Uh, We get to choose the pain we experience, which sounds weird. And it makes a lot of sense when you, as a human, look at people and go, oh, those are shitty people. I hope they feel that pain. But when it's children or, you know, people with cancer stuff, it's like, what? They don't choose that. So I don't mean in like the human ways they choose. Your soul chooses this long before you're born into this life. And we choose everything we're going to learn, everything we're going to go through, including all options under the free will category. And so I think people have a hard time, especially if you're a, a younger soul, understanding a lot of this. So I don't even try. Like, you know, when I meet an, a young soul and they hear what I do, because I am a psychic medium, I'm an empath, I'm a healer, a medical intuitive, and I can talk to animals, which is kind of... but. The other side of that, I can talk to animals. The animal thing, I'm definitely going to have to hear more of. <laughs> so the animal thing, yes, uh, you know, I've done workshops with horses and their owners. Uh, I do a lot of animal questions and stuff for people just because I love animals. I've never heard of that. Yeah, it's super fun. Um, <laughs> I, I especially the, yeah, I, I love the horse things and dogs because I love dogs. But horses are just amazing because they're so communicative in their bodies but people just don't understand. So like I'll go and do workshops to help the animals, help the humans understand what they need. But on the other side of that, I can also go to, you know, I, there was one guy, he had a car accident, I think when he was 19. And he had been um, not in a vegetative state, but, you know, he couldn't talk, he couldn't do anything. He hadn't moved out of bed. He couldn't even go in a wheelchair. And hadn't talked to anybody in his family. He could look at them, but he couldn't communicate. And I could completely communicate his words to the people in the room. So it's not just that I can talk to dead people. I can talk to all souls. Anything that has a soul, I can talk to. So uh, I know we kind of preface this conversation with the people that are going to listen to a story like this. And obviously, there's plenty of people that aren't going to believe. There's people that are going to believe. Yeah. And that's not exactly the the point is to just put it out there because it's a it's your story and let people yeah. make their own decision and you don't owe any anyone and anything but in regards to the animal thing can you how would you how would you do you have any examples of confirming of showing someone like, yeah this happened and this is how is there any tangible way or way anecdotally to explain how i you know, i have a lot i spent like a lot of people message me after any because a lot of people ask about their pets in readings um, and they message me after and say, say, you know, I caught, took my horse to the vet and they confirmed exactly what you said. Like little, they, they hadn't even thought of doing that one thing. Uh, another one, a horse, every time a person got on, got lame on one side. And it's because he was actually had a problem on the other side. They fixed the problem and then he was totally fine. Mm. Um, and honestly, I think you can probably go see on my reviews and stuff right. of people saying that, you know, like, wow. Because I, I can just talk to all. So, and it's so funny because we had three dogs, like when I had the stroke. Unfortunately, one got put down like five days after the stroke. She was really old, almost 18. And then my sole dog, Walter, um, died of cancer in March, which was the worst. And he always would communicate with me when any of them need something. And now I have one dog left and she was never too per- like very communicative because Walter did it all. And now she is. So now she comes up, she looks at me if I'm on the couch, because, you know, if the kids or husband are here and something need, like she needs food or out or whatever, she'll come over to me, tell me, and I'll say, go, she needs water. I can't see her water. I'm on the couch. She needs water. She needs food. She needs out. It's always correct. It's always right. And so they don't even question it now. They're just like, oh, okay, she needs water. The other day, day before yesterday, I said, she needs water. My daughter was on the couch and she leaned up to see if she had water. And she's like, yeah, she does. And I'm like, okay. And then Daisy came back out over and looked at me and I said, Grace, she does not have water. She just said she doesn't have water. She's like, okay, she doesn't. I know. I just didn't want to get up. (laughs) She and got the water. (laughs) And so when when you're having these, because my understanding of this is energy, I guess it's, it's it's communicative energy or that's the right way to say it or communicating yeah. through energy so when you say whether it's 
animals, which I've, this is the first time I've ever heard that. This is insane. And in, in an interesting way, not in a, you know. Yeah. And when you have these, Com- when you're able to say you talk, is it just a knowingness, or like you know what I mean, or is it? Yeah, it's all telepathic. Right. Okay. So I don't have to. It's not. Hey, how you doing? Same What's with up? in readings. Okay. No, in the beginning when I first accepted my gifts years ago, sometimes I had to like they would talk, I would listen, mm-hmm. and then I would repeat I, I, that lesson. But once I woke up from the NDE, my gifts were like on hyperspeed, and so that completely disappeared because on the other side, while I was there, I talked nonstop, but I didn't say one word. Nothing came out of my mouth. Like everything is telepathic. It's just energetic communication. And it's not just to people. It's through the ground, through the trees. I had never, I spent so much time just putting my feet in the grass because it was so amazing to feel that energy. And then I would go over to the creek and put my feet in the water because it kind of glowed with this like golden rainbow light and all of it's connected. And so then I woke up and I couldn't talk. Not I could say Michelle still and I could say fuck, but I did not have any other words, not even a slight hint of a word. I was completely paralyzed. But the one thing or one of the things that changed with going to the other side was Before I had a lot of boundaries with humans, like, you know, I'm a very strong empath and I have boundaries, right? I don't necessarily want to know what's going on for you unless you want to tell me. I lost that ability. So I woke up and at first I didn't realize the people, like people weren't talking to me. I could hear them talking to me. Their mouths weren't moving. And so I was like, what is like, what is happening? Like, I don't understand. At first, I thought maybe it was the brain damage. And then I'm like, every time somebody comes into the room, it's just pity. Like, oh, my God, I feel so bad for her. Like, did you hear she has young kids? Can you imagine having a massive stroke two days before Christmas? And I'm like, why are they talking about that around me? Like, my eyes are open. What is happening? And after a few minutes, I was like, oh, my God, they're not talking about it they're not talking to anybody. It's in their head. Like, so every person that came into the room obviously would see a 40 year old woman and go, Oh my God, poor woman. Like it's Christmas. I saw her kids here yesterday. I hope I never have. And that's their thought process as it is with anybody who sees such a young person with kids in the waiting room and a husband and family on Christmas eating freaking Denny's at Christmas day. Right? Like, And that was everybody's thought processes. And so I actually, at first, there was nothing I could do about it. I didn't know how to turn it off like I could before the stroke. So I just had to sort of deal with it and try and I would weirdly try and like cover my ear, although that doesn't help. Mm. Um, And then I had a couple of very bad like migraines. Um, And it was so bad that I couldn't have any light or anything in that couple. Apparently it's like the brain swelling and stuff like that. And so nobody bothered me and they kept the lights off and like super quiet and stuff like that. And I was like, okay, like it does get a little quieter if people aren't around me as much. And then I started just to get used to it. But if you ask my family, poor family (laughs) in the beginning, I like they would come and they tried to be positive, right. All the time. And like, you're doing great. And like, there's, there's rehab you have to do. Like, I couldn't talk, but your brain learns through repetition and remapping. And so if I could kind of get a word, I had to repeat it eight to 10 times, like to start to learn again. Right. And so my husband would come in and he'd be frustrated and sad and like, just like, what the fuck? It's crazy. This is horrible. And, but he'd come in and go, good morning. Like, oh, let's do this today. And I'm like, Mike, your thoughts are too loud. You need to stop. I can't handle it too loud. Like, and so my, I, not that many words, but so my new phrase became loud, too loud, too loud. And if they weren't talking, then they would realize it's their thoughts. They need to get a grip and then hang around, be around me again. And so everything became too loud. And then once I started talking and getting better and I was back home, um, I still was struggling with that part of it, right? The hearing everybody's thoughts and the kids would get frustrated because they would be 
being little jerks in their heads, but everybody was treating me with kid gloves. And so I'd be like, you guys quit it. Like, that's really, I don't want to hear it right now. And they're like, we're not staying and get out of our heads, mom. God. Oh so, man. It was definitely a different layer to the gifts that I, the gifts I had before. Um, but it's, it's gotten easier. I have started to get boundaries with that as well. Working is so much easier though. Like there is no pause, like their thoughts, their guides and stuff become my words. Mm -hmm. There's no, I don't have to ask for clarification. I don't have to like, Hey, what is that? What do you mean by that? Or anything like that? It's just, it's so much easier, this is like which a, is awesome. This is like a natural neural link with uh, Elon Musk is kind of working on right now. I have, a, yeah. I have a couple big questions, that were, like bigger general questions that I, I want to ask you. But yeah. before that, what is the what do the doctors or the medical community say about your experience? Like, what were like the fact that you know you survived through that? Like, what was the likelihood of you coming out as you know as you as you are now? Which you seem great. I know you have your chronic pain and you're still dealing with issues. You're not 100, percent but you still seem from my view. Yeah. You know. So even my neurologist who has been a neurologist for 30 years says I'm a miracle. They have no explanation. They have no, like if I was going to survive, which they didn't think I was, I was par blind. I would be paralyzed. I would never talk because I don't have any of those parts of my brain left. Um, and so they just say they don't understand they every like the the hospital I was flown to has a specialized stroke unit and the nurses that were there the day I came in I guess I really affected a couple of the women the nurses and they would just you know obviously felt just awful for me I had kids and whatever and when I went in after I was discharged um, for the first appointment I think a couple of weeks after I got home the neurologist actually said, do you think you could wait here for some nurses to come from the ER because like you really affected them and they would not believe that you're walking because I was completely walking. So they have no explanation. There is no reason that I had the stroke. And I did six or eight months of testing. They did every heart test, every, every test possible. Um, and again, I'm in Canada. So, you know, we have our medical system's slow, but it's free. So like they threw everything at me to try and figure out what the heck happened. Um, and they have no idea. Uh, they don't understand. And they didn't believe me that I wasn't blind. They took my license because of the seizure while I'm the stroke. And when I went for all the checkups, like with the neuro ophthalmologist, he didn't trust me that I could, I did the visual field. You put your head in a thing and see these lights I passed but they still wouldn't give me my license I had to do a whole new driving test to get my license back because they just don't understand my MRI tells them you know I have no brain my midbrain on the left side and if you look at the MRI it's gone uh, my frontal lobe I I'm missing about this much which is like a lot um, and they don't understand, you know, all of the things that I've regained, the talking, walking, um, feeling, cause I, I can feel, I can't feel sensory, but I can feel like the muscles underneath. So if somebody touches me, I know all of that is literally a 0% chance that I would have been able to do any of that. The neurologist said there was one other lady with almost a similar stroke, not the second one, but the first one. And she regains some speech, but he's never seen somebody like me. Nobody has ever seen, seen somebody like me. I had a couple of mini strokes after as I was recovering, which is super normal. And for one of them, I was brought in by ambulance and the doctor didn't read my chart. He just came to triage and he had a little piece of paper and he's writing on his, his paper. And I'm saying, you know, I had a completed MCA stroke. It was maybe like two months ago or whatever. And I had a secondary front, frontal lobe and I did blah, blah, blah. Tell, and he's like, okay, you know, like, yes, you're looking weak on that side. So let's get your CT. CT and then I'm going to go read your chart because I don't know if what you're saying, like for what you're saying two months ago, I just, I don't put it together. So let me just, 
I'll read your char- your chart while I while you go for your CT. So I went for a CT, and my sister works at the hospital, and she came because she knew I was there, and she walked up behind this doctor because she had worked in Emerge for almost twenty years, and she's like, "You better be nice to her. That's my sister." And he turned around and he looked at her and he's like, "This is your sister?" And she's like, "Yep." And he's like, "I didn't believe her when she came in, like." how is she, ta- like, I just saw her, how is she talking or walking? And she goes, well, that what they, like, they say she's a miracle. And he's like, yeah, I'd say so. He's like, I've never seen a brain like this. That's alive. I've never, I've never seen somebody like her. And that's every doctor that sees me, every doctor that I, cause I've had so many, right. For all these tests, different heart things. And everyone takes a different doctor. Mm-hmm. Nobody's ever seen somebody like me. Oh man. And it's, it's- that's why it was such an important question to me because I, I, I kind of anticipated an answer similar to that, that so many times, not so many times, but you hear it chalk up. It's a miracle. It's unexplained, but I mean, you all at the same time, you explained it, <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's unexplained, yeah. but from the, the humanoid medical, you know, more, uh, tangible explanation for something it's unexplained. You know what I mean? So it's, yeah. it's remarkable when you hear something like that and you, put it against your story. It's like, what the hell? Or what the heck? I don't want to say help because we just spoke about that. But what, what did you, what do you pull from this personally in regards to like, how is your life? Obviously it's changed in many ways, but in regards to the, the mantra and the way you live your life, what, what have you pulled from this? I just, I think the biggest thing is we're all learning. And no matter if you're learning hard lessons or easy lessons, they're all just lessons. And so, you know, we have built a world on judgment, reward and punishment. And that's how we survive, right? We punish those who are bad or weak and reward those who in society's eyes look, you know, amazing or like they're excelling. And each human on this planet, every single one of us are learning the exact same lessons at different times. We will all, every one of us, all of those things we judge in other people, all of us will live a life where we are murdered. We will all live a life where we are the murderer. We will all live a life where we abuse or are abused. We will all live a life where we lose a child we will all live a life where we are that child. We will all live every ounce of different lives in order to become the most enlightened soul that we can. And so all of those things we judge in other people, weaknesses we see, or, you know, judgment on their faith or their beliefs or their lifestyle or their gender or their race or whatever it is, you will live that life too. You will live a life and understand what you put them through by being an asshole or what they will put you through for them being an asshole. We will all live every facet of being human. And so it's, I think, important to not judge so quickly. Mm. Um, I think for me, especially my life before I accepted my gifts, I was a social worker. I worked in mental health and addictions. I was a soccer mom, very well respected as a human. I never in my wildest dreams wanted to accept my gifts. I hated it. I hated the fact that people could look at me and think I was crazy because, you know, if I wasn't me looking at my life, then I would be like, okay, she's nuts. Like, (laughs) what do you mean? She can talk to dead people or read people's minds or whatever it is. And now I wouldn't want to live any other way. You know, I see people's souls. And I think if people could understand that innately our souls are good. The lessons are hard and we do things that, you know, maybe as a human we aren't proud of, but our souls are amazing and so willing to learn and so willing to let us drag them along on the things we're doing. And, you know, I would never say somebody should be like me, believe like me or have faith like I do. But I think everybody should have some type of faith, whether it's just in yourself, whether it's, I don't know, Mother Earth or God or any other name. Just have faith that this is school 
and we all have a home, even if we are the most lonely. You know, we've never been more connected as humans or more lonely. The more connected we become, the lonelier we get. You know, we can in any given moment, especially like where you live, probably within, I don't know, a mile, there's hundreds, if not thousands of people. And yet some days people go an entire day without anybody even acknowledging them. Mm. It's so strange we the way we live. And going to, to uh, the other side, I really, really understood how much, you know, we plan these lives to learn because, you know, I knew my family would miss me if I didn't come back. But I also knew they planned that too. And there would be no hate. People on the other side don't have to miss us. You know, your loved ones and stuff. There's no missing because we're there too. It's just us, us that have to do that. So, you know, I still, I'm very human and I still sometimes think like, I, I get mad as anybody would, right? I, I had never been more successful as a human as I was the year before the stroke, the two years before. Like we finally had savings and, you know, we were both working and I feel like I was getting, feeling really comfortable in my life and in my gifts and I had to restart it all. And you know, I understand my higher self chose this for a reason, but you know what? Sometimes fuck my higher self. I don't want to be unhealthy and I don't want to have a stroke and I don't want to, you know, I still often, the doctors tell me my five-year survival rate is 14%. Still? Like, that's not fun. Do they say yep. right now? Yeah, but that's the statistics for people who aren't me, right? right? Usually with the type of stroke I had, you are nonverbal, you can't walk, you're in a wheelchair, you can't swallow, you know, so people die more from infections than more strokes, right? From bed sores and choking and that kind of stuff. So, but, you know, at least once every two weeks, I think at night, maybe I don't want to go to sleep because what if I don't wake up, mm. right? I'm still very human. I, you know, having the beliefs I do doesn't take away my humanness. And I think, that's good. I, I'd have thought. So when you're explaining how, hmm, try to think me to make, to make it take a second. So like I said, do this on the fly, guys. So bear with me. When when you're saying how we uh, kind of all experience different things, like you said, uh, we're gonna lose. Everyone's gonna lose a son. So it's like a multiverse situation. I don't know if it's the right way of saying it, but we have all. I guess reincarnate, yeah. and we have all these different experiences. But who I am right now, I like my dad. I, I, my dad died. And yeah. I remember him as my dad, but say my dad has had all these different experiences as someone else. When we pass, I only remember my, my dad as my dad physically in the way I see him and the way I know him. But if he's been all these other people and had these, all the, all these other experiences, how do I see him when I pass? If like we can, if we were to connect, he will him, look, he'll look exactly the same as I know him. Yes. hundred percent. Because yes, we <clears throat> we live tons of other lives. You probably don't look like this, your higher self on the other side, but our souls know each other. You know, your dad would have, yes, in this life as a, your dad, but probably in other lives, you were probably brothers, best friends, uh, mother and daughter, whatever. Um, again, gender, gender doesn't exist, right? But when, for all intents and purposes in this life, when you pass or when you go some, to see somebody like me, he will look exactly how you remember him. And when I when I do mediumship and, and channel loved ones on the other side, I don't like to see how they looked when they died. You know, it's not like TV where if they died in a car crash, they sh like that's freaky and I don't want to yes, see that. And right. I don't want, you know, <laughs> awful body parts and stuff. They just look how you remember them. Every once in a while, if somebody dies like old, like 70 or 80, they might look a little younger, but, you know, still the same. So. Right. I, I can I can tell people exactly how the person looked in order to confirm who they are right. for you. Mm. So they will you will recognize them. I can't say that you know once you're on the other side they'll stay looking the same. Um, but you know if if you've ever seen people like babies can see the other side and people with Alzheimer's can see the other side most of the time when they get to the other side like get to the end um, and they will say. Oh my gosh, so-and-so is here. 
you know, and this person maybe died in 1950, but they look exactly the same, right? Oh, Bob is here and he's saying, I'm up, I'm waiting for you. And oh, I'm so excited. And, or he talked about work and blah, blah, blah. They'll look exactly how you remember them. Okay. Well, that's, that's relieving in many ways. So are you not, one general question, are you not scared of death and dying at this point? No. I still, in a human way, I want to see my kids live. I want to be here. I, you know, I want to see them get married and graduate and all that sort of stuff. And I know, like in my soul, that no matter what, we all plan this. And so it would be okay if I wasn't here. But my mama heart, like... I, I just, there's no worse thing than leaving your child, right? No matter what age they are, there's no worse thing as a human, as a soul. You know, I, when I was on the other side, I could see my kids. I could see them here and I knew they would be okay and I could see them over there. So I know that I would be with them, right? As soon as I get there, I'm with them because their higher selves are here. But my mama heart thinks I want to be here, right. you know? So the, the process of dying I'm not scared at all. It's not painful. My physical body was in pain, but I went to the other side and let like left that pain. Same with like, if you, I've seen a lot of people die, like physically in the room, people always wanted me there, obviously, because I was gifted and I just didn't know and whatever. And when their bodies are in pain, like I've seen people die of cancer and it, it, it is, it's a painful death. Once they lose consciousness, their souls go and stand like in the corner of the room and watch their family come and all of that. So the soul isn't in the body. So it is just a physical body going through pain and you're not attached to it all at all. So you don't feel it. You're not suffering. Um, even if it looks like you are like my mother-in-law um, was like doing like these like almost convulsions because she was in pain. Her soul wasn't in her body anymore. Mm. So we get to choose. We can choose to stay in that body 100%. But if it's going to be a very painful death, um, a lot of the time we vacate. You know, car accidents when people, you know, that moment of impact is like extremely painful and then you die. Usually the soul leaves the body just before. Yeah, it's like an ejection button. I kind of, that makes me feel yeah. a little better. So too. it is. It, it wasn't, it literally was not scary. What? Being in my body was scary, mm. like here, very scary. And when I woke back up, that was scary um, and painful. But dying was the most amazing thing I've ever done. Do you have any opinions on on uh, substances or chemicals, however you want to call it? Like, you're familiar with like DMT or any hallucinogens that people have? For instance, like DMT, I'm not sure if maybe you are familiar with it, has kind of been described as like the dying drug because people that, I guess, haven't had an experience like you would relate it to it. So I don't know how much justice that gives it. But people have, have what I've heard and kind of experienced with DMT that it kind of feels like a, that trend, that sa a similar transition as it's been subscribed. Yeah. So do you have any opinion on, on dimethyltryptamine or ayahuasca or any I of those I think processes? people need to – you to Everybody used to ask me about, I think it's IU uh, something. Ayahuasca? Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, use with caution, I think. Because if your like, energy and soul is here, and in this life, you're going to go from here to here, right? In learning. So your soul will go from this age to like here. Um, that's what you're prepared for. And that's what your body's capable of. If you take a substance in order to reach this different level of consciousness and you go from here to here, you can actually trigger psychosis, anxiety, all kinds of things that then you got to carry with you the rest of your life. So it's a use with caution type thing. I would not ever suggest a really young soul do that <laughs> because they will go insane and they will suffer the consequences most of their life. I'm not saying they're going to die, yeah. but anxiety, depression, uh, intrusive thoughts, all these things, when you access these higher energies. And I think a lot of people that are very gifted, there's a fine line between being gifted and doing that and being crazy. So many psychic mediums go crazy or they get very depressed. They end up in the psych ward because they are accessing energies 
without cleansing themselves or maybe doing it too often. A lot of people get addicted to like the money if they're, you know, working a lot and they, they just keep doing it until exhaustion. I think like if, if there was ever a study and say like of people like me, their chance of going completely batshit crazy is probably a lot higher. So I think it's just sort of used with caution. I'm not saying don't, I never would because I would go from this because I'm such high energy to dead because that's, there's nowhere else to go. Um, but I think so many people are searching for purpose, for reason, like why does all of this happen? Why does bad things happen to good people? They're trying to find a purpose. What is their purpose? What is their path? And if I take this, maybe it's going to become clear, right? The path is to learn. There's not this wonderful 10 step thing that says, okay, this is what you're supposed to do. And I think a lot of people use those substances for that type of clarity. Mm. So, so, I mean, you do believe that those substances are, are they on purpose for that? Like, so you do believe that they actually do what they, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I think, and you probably can't, you know, like if you put somebody in my body, that's not used to these gifts and how like everybody says, you know, you can talk to your guides and everybody's loved ones. Why don't you ask like, Oh, why are you trying to make this decision? Just ask them. I don't ask my guides for answers almost ever because that's not their job. Like their job is just to walk beside me, not push me or guide me or direct me to a certain purpose. Right. And that's why I have my gifts Mm. because I don't tune in my, for myself, you know, I don't get the lottery numbers once in a while. I'll get like, who's going to win a football game or something just for, because my husband likes football and I'll put it in my phone. My notes on my phone are like a fountain of psychic information because I don't tell people, but I like to like put it in there. Listen, the Super Bowl's coming up, so I'm going to have to hit, stop on this and we're going to have to talk, Chris. <laughs> that might help me out. Uh, Daddy needs a new pair of shoes. But um, that, that's, that, I think that's all remarkable. And the way I kind of understood what you just said about you could just want to just ask for this is is a is a it's a bad analogy of like it's like when I when I first learned to ride a bike like my dad or mom would be like holding the bike for me kind of but then eventually they'd have to let go and I have to handle the bike like why wouldn't they just ride the bike for me all the time that's not gonna work I can't yeah. expect them to I have to learn how to ride the bike but I know they're there so there's kind of like yeah. a I don't know, like a safety net kind of thing maybe kind of feeling I don't know if it's like yeah. security is that- well and it's it it becomes addictive right mm-hmm. yeah. they will always answer but we when we ask our guides for something, uh, they will always put us on the path of the most learning. Whereas your human self will almost always choose the easiest, right? What is the best for, so when your guides give you direction and you make that choice and then it just goes to hell and you're like, what the heck? Like, why did I go this way? It's because that way you're learning the most and they want you to learn. So if you want the human thing like success or like I want it to just really be easy right now, I can't handle anything, make up your own mind. Right. And I think people like abuse it. I, I set a time limit. People aren't allowed to come to me more than once a year because it's not helpful. And even then, sometimes I don't let them come back for another year just because they didn't do any of the homework their guides said last time and they're expecting a different answer. There's people like me, well, not like me, but similar. They'll let people come twice a month, every week for psychic advice. It's like, what? Like that is, I I don't understand that. And I, yeah. So I think, I don't, I guess all different gifted people are different. Yeah. Um, You know, I could be a millionaire if I let everybody come back once a week. (laughs) Yeah. That's maybe that's a good sign of kind of steering clear. I feel like you got to be careful who you go to. And that's a big thing. Like how many people are doing it for the right reasons or just bullshitting you. That's a whole other thing. But uh, before we get out of here, I have one question. Can you tell if I'm an old soul or a new soul? Yes. Can I ask? Can I can I ask you, or is that something we should not cover right now? <laughs> we don't have to, uh, we don't have to go through it. It was just like a, literally that. Like if, if a soul, I got to put it in human terms, right? Because time doesn't exist on the other side. If you know, I go from one to a hundred. Let's say you're probably like seventy-seven. Uh, that seems pretty old. Yeah. I always yeah. Feel, you I've, haven't I've, had I've, an I've easy oddly, life. I've, I've oddly felt that, but I don't know if I'm making that up because I don't have yeah. the same. Uh, I'm not as, I guess, sensitive as you are. If that's I well, and I think too, though, for you, where like maybe other people wouldn't see like the soul age, you're 
again, I don't know. You haven't talked that much. So this is my, my um, ability to read souls. You are quite um, sarcastic. And I think you probably use humor a lot when you are dealing with things that are a, a little bit uncomfortable. And that kind of like counteracts the soul age. So probably a lot of people are like, oh, what do you mean? Like, he's just like so easy, and, you know, funny and whatever. But um, that's just your, you, when you get uncomfortable, you use sort of humor or whatever to, to sort of maneuver through things. Um, so I think maybe not everybody would see that you're a little bit more of an old soul because you kind of keep it under wraps. Mm -hmm. I think you also, um, not, you don't worry too much, but, uh, you know, you let the impression of who you are to the world, um, you're, st you still guard that. Yeah. <laughs> Just probably a little bit too much most of the time. So, Yeah. Jeez. Okay. I didn't look into a mirror after this. So <laughs> thank you for clarifying that. But uh, Amber, I want to thank you so much for being on here. Seriously. Uh, it was, it's a remarkable story. And I love hearing these stories. And I think there's, regardless of what people believe, I've said this before, I think that aside, uh, the lessons you just said, and like, it's, it's all positive, you know, like everything you said, yeah. and how it's affected your life. And it, it just seems it just seems so positive and comforting in many ways. So I think that is the most important thing to reflect on and your positivity with it. You know, I'm hoping that would connect with a lot of people that are listening right now. So I just want to thank you again. Yeah. And uh, do you have any, any cool, I, I'll thanks. give you any space if you have any, unless you said it all, is there anything you want to kind of bow out on in regards to what you got going on or just a last little punch out or anything of the sort? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. If people want to listen more, they can go to my Facebook. I have a TikTok now, but uh, I don't do it a lot. I'm not very techie, and I don't have any staff or anything, so <laughs> it's just me. Yeah, the only the, you are techie in, in in some ways because we've had some uh, energy interference going on through this entire <laughs> time. So maybe you don't say yourself too short. But uh, if anyone wants to find Amber, I'll I'll put your some of the information that you were comfortable sharing in the subscription of this episode. And uh, to everyone listening that's made it this far, thank you so much for another episode of Dead Talks, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Dead Talks. Please do not forget to hit the subscribe button and also the notification bell. That'll give you updates as to when we post a new video more episodes and more content in general. We are streaming on all the major podcast platforms, including Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pandora, and all that. And also find us on Instagram at Dead Talks Podcast or www.deadtalks.net. Thank you so much.